word, and we are here for your Holy Spirit to work among us through the Spirit-given gifts as we serve, show mercy, edify, teach, exhort one another, and also for the Spirit to work within us to bring conviction, restore joy, renewed hope, strengthened faith to live according to your will. So, Lord, we ask that you would do those things, that you would hear our requests, O God, and move in our hearts and in this church, we pray. In Jesus' powerful name, may it be so. Amen. Everyone worships. Everyone worships. That's what I want to posit this morning. Everyone worships. I have a picture here, a couple pictures actually I could show you of these are some people worshiping in a Hindu temple. These are some people worshiping in a Buddhist temple. Here are some people in India worshiping. Worship has been defined by Louis Giglio as the object of our mind's attention and heart's affections. The object of our mind's attention and heart's affections. Now, most of you have probably never even been maybe nearby a, a, a moment of worship like that around a Hindu temple, or maybe you've never walked into a Buddhist temple. Maybe some of you have, but, but here are some idols that are worshipped in the United States, and maybe, I like me, you have dealt with making some of these things the object of your mind's attention and heart's affection, if we're really honest this morning, right? Which we should be, because we're a church. We better not be lying to ourselves or to God or to each other. The house, keeping it up, maybe having a bigger or better house, remodeling the house, stressing out about the house when something breaks, getting anxious about the mortgage payment on the house, or maybe like my son, when he saw this car at an auto show with a friend a few years ago, he was just, whoa, dad, can we get one of those? It doesn't cost too much, does it? Like, yeah, right, never happening. Not in my lifetime. <laughs> Maybe if Hudson becomes a tech superstar or something, right, then I'll be prompting me to give all his money away to missions. But <laughs> so, iPhone 10, right? Here's some other uh, American idols that uh, we, we call singers who make it big. An American idol. And I'm not bashing any of these things as necessarily bad, but when they become the affection of our heart, or the object of our mind's attention, they could become an idol. We make a good thing a bad thing that makes it a God thing, which makes it really, really problematic. Or baseball, athletics, hockey, basketball, football. What's the object of your mind's attention and heart's affections? Or maybe for some of the moms with lots of kids, just like a cup of coffee, please. That's what's on my mind. That's my heart's affection. Going to have a cup of coffee this morning. And also at night. And also tomorrow. If we're really honest, we can make a lot of things our heart's affection, our mind's attention. So the question really isn't, do you worship? It's who or what do you worship? Because everyone worships something or someone. All of us worship something or someone. But as people who confess to know Jesus Christ, people who are saying, I believe that God the Father sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Son, God incarnate, came, and He lived a sinless, perfect life. On my behalf, He died on the cross, and He rose victorious on the third day, and I put my trust into Him. So people who call themselves Christians, we know that we are supposed to worship God, the triune God, yes? Yes, right. And yet, all too often, we're prone to objects, things, possessions as the mind's attention and heart's affection are pulled that way. We deal with two problems, really, I think. The first one is that oftentimes the affection of our heart is not the triune God. And, and I think the second problem is a lot of us, a lot of Christians, if I can use that word, I know it's a very broad generic label in North America, but as Christ followers disciples following Jesus and the Word of God, oftentimes we have confusion about what actually really is worship, right? I mean, wow, worship. Remember those days? 
Some of you already don't even know what I'm talking about. Man, when I was 18 years old, the wow, or 22, the wow worship albums were the thing. Keegan doesn't know what I'm talking about. Oh, he does. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so <laughs> wow worship albums. So when I turned that CD on, because that was when we used CDs, then that was worship because that was wow worship. And those songs are worship songs. Or our praise chorus is worship songs. Or our hymns worship songs. Is worship a particular style of music? You see where I'm going with this? Or is worship prayer? Or is worship something that we do on Sunday morning? Or at Thrive Group? Or on Wednesday night? Only on Sunday morning. Is that when worship happens? Or is worship when I'm driving in my car and listening to music? Or is, what is worship? What is worship? So the question this morning is, what are the essential movements of Christian biblical worship? The Bible talks a lot about worship. The Old Testament uses lots of words to describe worship. The New Testament uses several words to describe worship. But there are, I believe, four key movements of biblical Christian worship that I want to walk through this morning. And this brings us to our third core DNA element. We've been in the series now. This is the third Sunday in the DNA, and I keep forgetting to allow them to play the bumper video that Keegan made. It's so awesome. I promise that you will see that, that intro video next Sunday, right? Okay. It, it, it shows you the, the five core DNA elements. These are the things that are essential and unique, and if these things are not true about us as a local church, then we're not a biblical, authentic, obedient to Jesus kind of church. That's how vital these DNA threads are, our core values. The first one was radical love. We display or we, we show the irresistible love of Jesus by sacrificing personal time, comfort preferences to joyfully serve one another. The second one we looked at last week was unshakable truth. We follow God's word as our perfect guide in every circumstance of life, so that we know his design in every circumstance of life. And this third DNA, this third core value that we're going to look at is vibrant worship. So the, the four essential movements of biblical worship. And it begins really with this, this first phrase here, worship the triune God. We worship the triune God through, but we have to pause there. We have to put halt because... This implies that we are in right relationship with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? You have to be a Christian to worship Christ. You have to be in right relationship with God the Father through faith in the Son, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and dwelt with the Holy Spirit in order to rightly worship God, the triune God. You have to be in relationship with Him according to the terms that he gives. We don't come to God on our terms according to the worship, the way we want to worship him. We come to relationship with him according to the terms that he has set, according to his covenant. So the, the old covenant and the new covenant, you're familiar with those terms. We come into relationship with God as New Testament Christians through the new covenant in Christ's blood, his atoning sacrifice. And it begins with that gospel in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, or verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul there is writing about the gospel, the good news of God to believers in Rome, most of them Gentile believers, some of them perhaps had Israelites who had converted to Christianity or Jews had converted to Christianity and matriculated over into, into Rome, but most of those would have been Gentile believers in Rome, and he's writing to them about the gospel and its implications for the believer because he says in the first chapter that they are in the faith, they are chosen of God, they are redeemed, they are those who have believed the gospel. But the first step of, of how we worship, the first movement begins first with we have to be in right relationship with this triune God. And so it begins, then Paul begins in chapters one and two of his letter to the Romans that God's righteousness is displayed through the gospel that Jesus Christ died in our place and that through 
everyone who believes in him will be saved. For everyone who believes, it's salvation. It is rescue from eternal condemnation. However, chapters 1 and 2, as he goes on, outline that God's righteousness is revealed in his judgment on sinners, in condemnation. First, he explains about how the Gentile world displays their unrighteousness, their rejection of the creator, and in turn to worship the created thing. And they have fallen into grave and gross and disgusting sin, separated from God, but they all were born to pray. That's also you and me, right? We're all not pure-blooded Jewish ethnicity, as far as I know, and so we're all Gentile believers, but we're born depraved and in sin. And so Paul brings out this argument, very logical thread towards the, to the end of chapter 1 in the book of Romans, that everyone stands condemned. And in the beginning of chapter 2, he says, but, but you also, and he's speaking particularly to Jews there too, that if, if you have done according to God's law and yet you still fail in one mark. If you look at those people and you say, well, I'm not like them, therefore I don't stand condemned. He said, well, by the way, actually everyone, Jew, Gentile, you're all condemned under God's righteousness. God's righteousness is revealed in his condemnation of sin because he's holy, because he's perfect, just, righteous in every way. So he must justly condemn all sinners. And yet, then from Romans chapter 3, 4, 5, where does it move? From the gospel and condemnation to then justification. God's righteousness is revealed in justification, justifying sinners, justifying those condemned. How does God in Christ accomplish that? Through Christ's death in our place. And we receive right relationship with God. We enter into this relationship by faith. The just shall live by faith. They're made and declared righteous by God through faith in Jesus Christ, not of our own works. So Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. Everyone falls short of the glory of God, right? Romans 6, 23, though, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The paycheck we deserve is death, eternal separation, condemnation, but God in Christ offers rescue. So, from condemnation to justification, just as if I never sinned, right? That's how I remember memorizing that, that definition of justification when I was in quizzing as a little kid. So God looks at you, looks at me, and it's just as if you never sinned because you're clothed with not your own righteousness, because that's filthy rags. No, you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And then from chapters 3, 4, 5 in Romans, then he moves to chapters 6 and 7, which talk about our sanctification. That as those in right relationship with God who've placed their faith into God's Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, then God, the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, is making us more like Jesus Christ. He asks this question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he uses this Greek phrase, meganoito, may it never be, God forbid. Don't even think like that, that's impossible because those who've been justified out of their condemnation by Jesus Christ are going to grow. They have a new life, they're born from above, they have newness of life. Therefore, you don't live under the old master, that which you had before, you live under the new master, Jesus you're a slave of Christ. That's what, why Paul uses that phrase to describe himself. I'm a doulos of Christu. Doulos, a slave of Christ, servant of Christ. Sanctified progressively by the work of God through his word and the Holy Spirit. And then in chapters 8, 9, he talks about glorification. What is to come? That God is doing something through you and he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is really good news because it means that though in the process of sanctification, you're still dealing with what? The battle, right? Between the flesh, between the old man and the new man. To walk in step with the Spirit is a daily walk, but in glory, when your bodies are clothed with immortality and light, when you see Jesus face to face, you won't deal with that anymore. Oh, I can't wait for that day. You won't deal with pride, envy, anger, lust, 
anymore in your soul because you will be finally redeemed. Future tense, right? You have been redeemed, you are being redeemed, and you will be redeemed fully. And the whole earth will be redeemed, made new. That right now, the earth is groaning with birth pangs. That's how it's described in Romans chapter 8. Longing for the day of final redemption. And so we feel that too, don't we? Right? When your bones ache, when your knees don't want to move, when your back hurts, when your nose runs, when you have a sore throat and congestion like me right now, right? When, when your kids get sick, when you deal with sin in your life, Lord, soon come, soon come and make all things new. Glorification. And all of this is God's work. God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel of God. And God's righteousness is revealed in condemnation of sinners and justification of those sinners by faith in Christ and sanctification of those in Christ and glorification when Christ returns. And then chapters 9 and 10 and 11, he starts to weave in that God has not forgotten his chosen people Israel. The national Israel still is the chosen of God and God is, will complete his plan for Israel in the future. God is, but we are grafted in. And then in chapter 10, he says that the gospel proclamation is, is a necessity. How will they hear? Unless there's a preacher. So just as God drew us to the gospel, we're called to proclaim the gospel, and God has not forgotten his people, Israel. So turn with me now to Romans chapter 11. Theological statements always lead to doxological praise. Doxological means to Give God glory from condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, and eschatology, all these kind of $10 words, but it leads to worship. So the Apostle Paul can't help himself, and this morning we shouldn't hold back. We can't help ourselves. Look at verse 30 of chapter 11 of Paul's letter to the Romans. He says this, for just as you once were disobedient to God, all right, is that you, is that me? Yes, thank you, Keegan. Right. All right. But now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So he's speaking, and this is the end of the conversation about God's future plan for national Israel and his mercy towards us as those who are outside of Israel. They disobeyed, but we received mercy. And then he says, You've shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these, this is verse 31, also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. The extension of mercy is also for the Jews and the Gentiles. The offer of salvation, the gospel of God. We've been shown mercy. Look at verse 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all, and the word all means all, everyone who believes. That's how he began the letter, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It is salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he launches into worship. Look at verse 33. I want you to stand and read this with me because it is it's so good. The first step is intentional remembrance. Now, stand with me and and he uses exclamation points. Well, of course, those punctuation marks weren't in the original Greek manuscript, but it's implied by the verb tense and by what he's saying. So if by all means, shout it out if you believe it and if you mean it, all right? Because I am, I may go hoarse by the end of this sermon with my cold and all. All right, here we go. Because of all this, think about, think about what we just walked through. Condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, and God's faithfulness to national Israel, and the mercy that we've all received. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. What does the Greek word amen mean? Nancy Campbell, our bookkeeper, asked me that last week. And it's pronounced in Greek amen, which means verily, truly, so let it be. May it be so. Lord, 
this is what we believe. This is true. And all those rhetorical questions. Who is first given to him that it might be paid back to him? Who is his counselor? Nobody. There's no God like our God. No one like our God. There's no one like our God. Turn with me to Psalm 77. Psalm 77, verses 11, 12, and 13. 11, 12, and 13. There is one, there is one word that's used all throughout the Bible that summarizes the first movement of biblical worship. It's remember, intentional remembrance, which is why we just walk through the whole argument of Romans because we need to rehearse, re-preach, remember God's good news that we have been shown mercy, that we have received pardon, and we are in right relationship with God. And here in Psalm 77, verse 11, here's the word as well. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate, that is to think about, chew on, recall, write down on all your work and muse Ponder on all your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? And the answer to that question is, of course, nobody is like our God. And so we are to remember who God is and remember what God has done and remember who we are in him because of his amazing mercy in his gospel. It's not our gospel, it's his gospel. It's his good news to the world. It's not of our own righteousness, which is like rags you want to throw in the trash can. No, but of Christ's righteousness. And so we sing. We sing. Christians are a singing people. I've been around the world a lot. Just God's provided opportunity for me to do that. And I've heard Hindus chant, and I've heard, I've heard Muslims chant, I, I, but Christians sing. There's a difference, and they sing with joy. They sing with passion. Christians are a singing people, and this is different than any other world religion out there. We are a singing people. Why? Because lang singing, song is a language of the soul, and it, it, it impregnates those those tunes, those words into our minds and they don't let go. I just was sharing a story with some family out there, some friends in the foyer this morning about when I was a teenager, we used to go to this nursing home every other week as high schoolers, about 20 of us, and we'd walk around singing songs, mostly older hymns, because that's what those folks knew and we wanted them to remember. And there's this one elderly lady, Laverne, my sister might remember her. And, and her mind was completely gone, except she would walk behind us with these big pink slippers like this. She tried to escape several times, by the way, too. And she knew every word to every song. She couldn't remember the names of her children or her late husband or our names. It was, hi, nice to meet you, every time we went there. But she remembered amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. She remembered how great thou art. Then sings my soul. Oh, praise the Lord. She, she knew those words. Christians are a singing, singing people. Because we need to remember. We do it intentionally. And you may say, I don't know how to sing. I think I'm off tune because when I open my mouth, the people sitting next to me to my left and to my right start going, what? And I don't think it's because I sound great. So what? So what? Right? Or maybe go and have Dale give you music lessons, right? Sing because God has called us to rejoice and to sing passionately. And it internalizes that truth of remembering what God has done all through the steps of salvation through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to bring you into right relationship with him. And when you are weary, when you're going through trial, when you're going through tribulation and pain and difficulty or darkness in your life, what will come to mind? Those songs. Those words that you have voiced to the Lord in prayer. The last thing my grandpa Jack 
passed away last year, remembered were songs, hymns on his dying bed. That's what he remembered. He didn't know my dad's name. He remembered how great thou art. We remember God, so we sing. And then we preach. We preach Christ boldly. We, we read the word of God publicly. Turn, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, just really quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. This is a command that we must do this as a collective group of followers of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. God commands Timothy, a pastor, to do this. Until I come... This is Paul writing to the young pastor, Timothy, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Why? Because through reading the Word of God, holding it up, the Bible, the scrolls, right? We remember what God has done in the past, what He prophesied of old, what He accomplished for us, and what He will do in the future. And that is intentional remembrance, rehearsing, re-preaching the good news of God we sing, we preach, we teach with boldness, declare Christ and Him crucified. The Word of God commands us so. Now turn with me back to Romans, back to Romans, to chapter 12, verse 1. As you're turning there, there's one final step. If we sing and we read and we preach and we teach, the picture of remembrance is in the Lord's first ordinance that he gave to his disciples and to us, isn't it? It's in communion, celebrating the Lord's Supper. So that we remember, and how does the verse finish? Until he comes, right? Because when we're going through challenge and difficulty and trial, and we're facing the birth pangs of a broken world, we need to remember what he's done in the past because it's a promise and a model for the future about his faithfulness and what he will do when he comes again and what we've received in him. We are in right relationship with God because of mercy. This is why we do what we do here. Now back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The second movement, we move from intentional remembrance to total submission Therefore, I urge you. Therefore means, so what has gone on before? For this reason, because of all the argument that we just walked through in the letter to the Romans about the gospel of God and condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, you're going to get this before you walk out the door this morning. Therefore, because of all that, we've received mercy. I urge you, I beseech you is the old-fashioned word, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Why? Because you have received mercy, the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This is what every Christ follower is called to do, to total submission. This phrase, a living and holy sacrifice, would have brought to mind to those first century believers the picture of Abraham taking Isaac up Mount Moriah. Total, unreserved commitment. Unreservedly committed to the will of God at any cost, no matter what. I will have faith in the faithful one. I will do as he says. I will obey the will of God, no matter if it makes sense. I will do what God has called me to do. That was the heart of faith in Abraham. So he takes his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah, and then God provides a ram for sacrifice, and God has provided the perfect lamb of God as a sacrifice for our sins. So that was just a picture of what God would do in the future, and now we're recipients of that. And so we then bow, as Abraham did, in total submission to God. Say, whatever you want, I will do. I will obey your word. I will walk in alignment with your will. I have to get the wheels on my truck aligned soon because it's starting to pull off the road. Probably need to get my tires rotated as well. And so the balance, 
the wheels, and then they'll do an alignment on it to make sure it goes straight down the road. When, a, when your wheels are out of alignment, your vehicle wants to pull off the road. It's exhausting to ride, a, to drive a car that's totally out of alignment. You know, it starts to maybe get a thumping noise. You, you're constantly pulling it back straight on the road, especially if you're on a long road trip, you know, going down the expressway at 70 miles an hour. Things get out of alignment, and that's how it is when Christ followers live out of a, outside of alignment with the will of God. We have to be in alignment, and then it's not spiritually exhausting and depressing to follow Jesus when we're walking in alignment with God's will. And this is what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is calling us to do. Totally committed to the will of God, no matter the cost, no matter if it makes sense, I'm going to obey God's will. I'm going to walk in alignment according to what he has patterned for my life for your life. Total submission is pictured in the word for worship in the Old Testament. And I think I'm going to invite Keegan actually up here to demonstrate this. Yeah, come on up here, Keegan. So since you're sitting on the front row, you're a good guinea pig. If you could just lay down right there, just lay flat on the ground. Yeah, right there. Uh-huh. No, no, no. No, other way. On your face, actually. <laughs> Do you need help? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> that is actually how the word doing homage, right? In the Old Testament, that word is used to describe worship to the king, do homage to the son. In one of the Psalms, it says, kiss the son. That is to kiss the feet of the sovereign. This is foreign to us as Americans because we live in a federal republic, dem democratic nation, we elect our officials so we wouldn't kiss their feet, right? But with a monarch, you would have kissed their feet. You would have walked in, and when they're like this, and they hold their giant scepter, with, which was a giant weapon of metal, sharp object, and they could kind of do whatever they want with Keegan's head there, Right? And if, they, if, they, if you didn't do what the king wanted you to do, the king could lop off your head. Just like that. The, the word for worship in the Old Testament is to, is to bow, prostrate before God on your face. Now, you might do that in private times of worship, or, or maybe you do that down here. I don't, you, know, you could, right? Outward expression of what you want to make true in your relationship with God in your heart. But this is the picture of how our heart is submitted totally to the will of God. And then by God's mercy, here's what happens. God says, you can, by my mercy, you are forgiven. Yes, you stood condemned. You're a sinner, but you're justified because you put your faith in my son, Jesus Christ, and you can stand. This is how the, the letter of Jude ends. You can stand in my presence. That's what God invites us to do. And so Keegan can stand in God's presence, not because of his own work or his own effort, but because of God's mercy. And he could rejoice and worship with a heart submitted like that. So let's give Keegan a hand for embarrassing himself there. So I ask you, I ask you this morning, and I ask myself this, is there anything in your life that is not totally submitted to Christ? That's a big question, isn't it? Oh, man. Anything? Yeah, anything. Is there anything out of alignment with God's will in your life? In your thoughts, in your desires, with your words, with your actions. This is what God is calling his people to do. It's not to try to earn a relationship with God. No. This is built on the gospel of God. Therefore, I urge you, in light of all that I've talked about, Paul is saying, throughout the whole letter to the Romans up to that point, present yourselves as a living, holy sacrifice to God. Is there anything in my life, anything in your life, today, right now, for the past week, that is out of alignment with God's will, that doesn't demonstrate total submission to God? That's what worship looks like. The Greek word for worship, used in the New Testament, proskuneo, 
is also used later on for bowing down, total submission, expressing that. I'm bowing before you to do whatever you desire in my life. Total submission to God. The third movement to worship the triune God is grateful obedience. So look with me back now at verse 2 of chapter 12. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How do we know the will of God? It comes through the word of God. And our grateful obedience is expressed in service. That's why he continues for verse 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and 8 to talk about spiritual gifts, spirit-given gifts to edify, encourage, build up, exhort the body of Christ. So our grateful obedience is expressed to God in service to one another. And the way that we're going to walk in step and not be conformed to this world, which is selfish, angry, filled with vitriol, Greed, all that's characterized by the works of the flesh, no, the works of the Spirit, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is to be demonstrated in our lives. Look with me quickly, even at verses 6, 7, and 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with generosity or liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, Cling to what is good because you can cling to what is good by knowing the will of God through the word of God. It is good and acceptable and perfect. It gives God glory. That's the movement of worship, intentional remembrance, total submission, grateful obedience, thankful obedience, not a duty ethic that we we cower and walk around on eggshells before God. No, we can stand and joyfully obey him because we have received mercy in his sight through Christ. To have obedience for a child to obey his parent implies that that child is going to do everything that the parent expects and asks of that child. And so when we approach God's word to worship him, we need to come before him and learn what does he expect of our lives? What does he ask of us? And to be a grateful, obedient follower of Jesus is to say, I'll do it. I'll do it. And we're empowered to do that through the gospel of God. Intentional remembrance, total submission, grateful obedience, and joyful celebration. Joyful celebration. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Joy is woven throughout, throughout the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, that when we approach God, because of his gospel, we can respond with joy. Yes, there's a time for grieving. There's a time for for working through loss. There's a time to cry at a funeral service. God has designed us that way. And yet when we ponder the hope of the gospel, even in that, we can celebrate joyfully, can't we? That the best is yet to come. That Jesus will return. That we can stand in his presence because of his mercy. So we can sing passionately. We can pray expectantly with faith. We can preach Christ boldly. We can celebrate the Lord's Supper. And how is this pictured also? Joyful celebration in baptism. In baptism is when we declare, I'm all in, I'm rejoicing, I'm going to obey Jesus, I'm going to do what he asks of me, I'm going to be totally submitted to him. I've never seen this more beautifully pictured than when I was in India the first time 12 years ago, and there was a a Hindu woman, and she confessed Christ ready herself for baptism, and as we lifted her up out of the baptistry, she wiped the bindi marking off her forehead, that which 
denoted that she was a Hindu. She wiped it off with tears of joy in her eyes, and she said, praise to Christ, praise be to God, because I have a, a new king. His name is Jesus, and it was celebration, joyful celebration like none other. And yet then I heard just moments later from her pastor that she would be kicked out of her home. Her husband would disown her. Her family would never speak to her again. And yet she did it with joy because of Jesus Christ. Celebration because of Christ. That's why we celebrate. That's why we have communion. That's why we baptize here. I want you to all stand with me. Our, our last, our core DNA here. Our, our final step is this. I want, if you believe this, you can read it with me. This is our core value number three. Ready? We pray expectantly, preach Christ boldly, sing passionately, give generously, and celebrate joyfully in baptism and communion. Take a seat for just one more moment. I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me and think about this. And think about this even throughout the rest of the day today. What has God done in your life? Write it down. Write it down. How great is our God? There's no one like our God. How has he proven his greatness in your life? Think about it. Write it down. Rejoice in that good news. What mercy you have received. What pardon has looked like in your life. What forgiveness has done in your soul. What the word has done to renew your mind and transform your whole perspective about life. Write it down. Think about it. Muse on it. Ponder the greatness of our God. And tell your children about it. Tell your grandchildren about it. Re-preach it to yourself. Rehearse it. Think right now. Two or three things that God has done for you on your behalf by his power in the gospel. Is it something seemingly small? Well, it's not small to God because it's a work of God. Keep a wondrous works list in your life of what God has done in you. That's what the people of Israel did. That's what Christians have been doing for the last 2,000 years. And we put it down in song so we remember it, so we remember what he's done. And then it compels us to worship, to worship. Lord God, we praise you. You are good. You are righteous. You are holy, and we stand in all of your matchless work throughout the ages. Your plan of redemption exemplifies your grace and love which has been so richly poured out upon our lives. We were born in a state of rebellion toward you. We stood apart from you in the vileness of our depravity. We lived in a manner opposed to your character. We spoke against the holiness of your name. Yet in our sinful state, you lovingly predestined us to be conformed to the image of your Son. You have chosen us, called us, justified us, and through the propitiation of your son, we have the hope of glory. For this, our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and praise this morning. We thank you for drawing us near, we who were apart from you. We thank you for granting us peace where there once was animosity. We thank you for making us alive in Christ, we who were dead in sin. We praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to reveal you to us and provide redemption through his death on the cross. We ask by the power of the Holy Spirit, you keep us ever mindful of your mercy, ever thankful for your vast and gracious love. Grant us the power to reveal your character and truth to this world through our selfless love for one another and for you. May we, oh Father, be united as Mayfair Bible Church around these DNA threads, the core values to be a people of radical love, of unshakable truth, of Vibrant worship through Christ, through Christ our rescuer. And all God's people say, amen. Would you stand as we close with this great song about how great our God is?